Hi, my name is Julie Cho. I have a screen time of four hours per day. I experience imposter syndrome and I have a poor working memory. Today I'm going to be talking about the implications of growing up with the internet and by that I'm referring to Gen Z. Our generation. As much as I hate saying that phrase, we grew up with the internet and much of our identity is tied to it. This includes how the internet could have possibly affected the way we think, learn, and even grow as people. I find that now we are all becoming increasingly reliant on the internet and this problem proves to be even more relevant during the pandemic. My friends and I talked about our astronomical screen times while we're doing social distancing and it's not just us. So I'm going to be listing seven different implications of being raised on the internet. One really important question to ask yourself is, is that really your opinion or did you just internalize what you last saw on your newsfeed? Most of us don't take the time to research and fact check everything we see online. And sensationalized content is not just a tactic used by major news outlets anymore. It's also the social media influencers and the clout chasers who just mix together a pretty graphic, a big number, and some emotionally charged content and call it a day. It's not just Fox News, it could be anyone. So a study by Fan shows that emotion is a powerful tool for persuasion and it's associated physiological arousal play a significant role in what makes content go viral. And to further support this, another study by James Devitt shows that tweets about political topics that include moral and emotional language are more likely to spread within the ideological networks of the sender. That makes sense. So this means content that is either very liberal or very conservative is more likely to be shared than content that is just neutral or a little liberal. I've personally been seeing a lot of very liberal posts, even like pro-socialism posts on my Instagram feed. And I think this is because most of the people I follow or interact with already have liberal views, but then they're more inclined to share content that lies increasingly on the left. And this leads us to the next point, which is... Social media is an echo chamber. An echo chamber is the phenomenon by which ideas circulate inside a closed system and users seek out only those sources of information that confirm or amplify their views. Social media platforms and online services are becoming more and more personalized for you and your interests. I mean, it makes sense because they profit off of attracting and retaining your attention. A great example of this is the TikTok algorithm. Basically, the algorithm is so good at creating a feed that you specifically are interested in that the For You page is actually a more accurate reflection of your interests than the feed that you've created for yourself, which is your followings page. And this largely explains why it's so easy to just mindlessly scroll on the For You page for hours and hours because service personalization not only increases usage time but also user satisfaction. But what can this mean? Well, we have to be aware of the potential dangers of this artificial intelligence keeping you in this small bubble of people who think like you and have similar opinions as you. Like just how much do you think our world views and views on ourselves can be shaped by an algorithm? A lot. Service personalization is everywhere. The internet does help bring people together, but I think that it can also be very polarizing since it makes it very easy for us to socialize selectively. Although I just use TikTok as an example, I think that most of us already live in an echo chamber with friends who share similar political views as us or are just from a similar socioeconomic background. We live in the age of information today where 2.5 quintillion bytes of data are produced by humans every day. And although data is not synonymous with information, that's still a pretty good indicator of just how much information is available for us to consume. I don't know about other people, but I personally feel like I constantly have to be consuming something. I always have to be listening to music, watching something, checking the news. And I think this in conjunction to the hustle culture that is so 
ubiquitous today is making us feel pressured to be productive all the time. Being overly busy is the new normal and we don't really realize that our brains are being constantly overstimulated. We fear that we're going to be missing out on something even though excessive consumption does not contribute to our well-being. And even when we are aware of this addiction, we can't stop. The imposter syndrome, if you don't already know, is a psychological pattern in which an individual doubts their accomplishments or talents and has a persistent internalized fear of being exposed as a fraud. So one of the reasons why I think we experience imposter syndrome more than ever now is because we are becoming more and more result-oriented. We see well-polished, well-edited images and stories of other people all the time, from your friends' face tuned Instagram pictures to stories about 20-something-year-olds becoming self-made billionaires. And because of this, I think we place greater focus on the end results rather than the process of achieving that result. In other words, we focus largely on the idea that is very much related to things like money or success to the point where we can neglect the actual experience itself. More often than not, we only see the success, the numbers, and the achievements of others. We rarely get to fully know how many times they failed before that, how many times they've embarrassed themselves, or even the extent of their family connections. And in this meritocratic modern world, we don't properly acknowledge the role of luck in the making of one's success or failure. And yet, we expect the same results. Not of the degree of their success, but to attain that success without a full understanding of everything that goes on behind the scenes into producing that result. We all know that our memory is deteriorating and our attention span is declining. Our attention span actually decreased from 12 seconds in 2000 to 8 seconds in 2015. So why can't we remember things anymore? I narrowed it down to these two factors. One, our brains are so overloaded with information that we don't even know what to filter out. And it's also harder for us to retain the actually valuable information. And as the economist and psychologist Herbert A. Simon said, what information consumes is rather obvious. It consumes the attention of its recipients. Hence, a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention and a need to allocate that attention efficiently among the overabundance of information sources that might consume it. Two, we rely heavily on the internet as our transactive memory. And transactive memory is defined as a system of collective memory that is shared between members of a group. Traditionally, we thought that valuable input would be stored in our short-term memory, and then with rehearsal, it would be consolidated into our long-term memory. But I don't think this explanation is reflective of how our memory works anymore, simply because we don't need to remember things anymore. Because most of the information you need is already available on the internet or it's stored in your phone somewhere. To make an analogy using a computer, instead of storing this information internally in our memory, we offload it to an external drive, which is the internet or your device. And the problem is that we're offloading more information than we probably should. We often overestimate our true understanding of things like climate change, foreign policies, human behavior, and even ourselves. So there was an experiment by Rosenblatt and Kale. They asked a group of Yale undergrad students a series of questions about how a zipper functions. Then the participants were asked to explain how a zipper functions. And this question made them realize that they actually have no idea. Then they were asked to reevaluate their true understanding of the mechanism of a zipper and the participants ended up lowering their knowledge rating by a point or two. We're so reliant on collective knowledge that we treat the knowledge and the minds of others as if they're our own. We think that we know a lot, but individually we know very little. We often confuse the availability of information with the acquisition of knowledge. But how can we not feel knowledgeable when there is access to millions of books, articles, and journals online? 
one of the main reasons why I wanted to make this video was because of my personal experiences of moving around. I saw that it's very possible for two different people living on different continents to find the same things funny, undergo the same education curriculum, and even use the same kind of slang. People's sense of humor and language, which I thought were highly contextual and almost exclusively influenced by local culture, were actually converging. Maybe because we consume the same kind of content, I definitely think that this is not all just from using the internet, but it's also the effects of globalization in general. I think this is a difficult topic to tackle, but it's still worth exploring. I just changed the location for the conclusion because this room just has the best lighting. So this is obviously not an exhaustive list of all the implications of the internet on our generation. My thoughts are extremely limited to my worldview, my personal experiences, and the books and articles that I've read. That being said, I put the links to all the relevant articles and books in the descriptions if you're interested. Mm, I hope this was somewhat interesting. Uh, <laughs> It's a long video. If you're still watching, thank you. <laughs> Please let me know what you think. I had a lot of fun writing and filming for this video. Hopefully I'll be back with another one of these videos. And until then, bye.